I want to give you a little bit of time to find Deuteronomy chapter 22. Give you a little bit of time to find that. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Um, as you turn there, I do want to extend an invitation to everybody. Again, tonight, this afternoon, 5 o'clock. And I know what some of you have already told me. I don't play softball. No, but you can come and be a part and cheer on and, and sweat with the rest of us, right? And uh, so the reason we do these things is not just so we can beat Midpoint Baptist Church, which is going to happen, right? We don't do that just to do that. We do that um, because we want to enjoy each other's company. We want to really encourage their body. Um, I talked to their pastor just this week, and he's just wanting their body to be an encouragement to us. Um, here's what I love. I love two churches going the exact same direction, um, and we're there to encourage one another um, and, and to build each other up. Um, and so we'll do that not on the baseball field, right? Not on the softball field, because the softball field, we dominate. But outside of the, outside of the lines... I'm your best bud, right? I just want to encourage you. I want to pray with you, those type of things. So uh, just come. Bring your lawn chair. You'll want to bring that. Bring your own drinks. There'll be drinks there, but you'll want to hydrate. Bring your side dishes, all those things. But come just with an attitude to get to know somebody you don't know, haven't ministered to, or you want to catch up with somebody. Man, just come come and do that. Um, so, But we also need as many people to come and play as possible. All right, did you everybody get enough time to get to Deuteronomy chapter 22? So... Uh, we are now hitting a phase of the book of Deuteronomy where we're getting ready to get into some chapters where, and we kind of hit it last week, where different verses, um, different sections really don't relate to the others. And there's just no possible way we're going to be able to handle every single word from the rest of this chapter, um, the rest of the book. There's just no possible way. So we're going to be taking larger portions of scripture that I was telling to, I was telling, uh, David Shelby this morning, I had, by the, t by the end of it, I had over four pages worth of notes and I'm like, okay, well, Lord, there's just no way into a phase or a stage of the Bible stage of the book of Deuteronomy, where there's just a bunch of random little laws, right? So if you are understanding of the old Testament, especially the old Testament law, there's 613 different laws that the Jewish people had to keep. And why 613? Because the point is the fact that they can't keep them. It's not possible. There's no way you can keep all that law. You need Christ. He is the one who ultimately fulfilled all of it. And so we're, we're thankful for him. But in Deuteronomy chapter 22, uh, verses 1 to 3 is where we're going to spend the majority of our time. Um, and then I just want to share a couple more things from the, the next couple verses. And, and that's, that's where we'll kind of land um, today. But Deuter Deuteronomy, I can't say Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 1. Does everybody say amen. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it unto thine house, and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it, and thou shalt restore it to him again. In like manner, thou shalt do with his ass, and so shalt thou do with his raiment, and with all lost thing of thy brothers, which he had lost, and thou hast found, shalt thou do likewise, thou mayest not hide thyself. All right, so just a quick, quick overview. You, you find something that belongs to somebody else, whether you know them or whether you don't know them. There's not finders, keepers, losers, weepers, right? There's not finders, keepers, losers, weepers. The idea is that you found something, you, you, you know who it might belong to, and you restore it, you return it back, right? So let's just say Matt Kerr loses a cow. You happen to be on, your road, on the road getting ready to go fishing at some farm pond. You find a cow which Matt tends to lose cattle every now and then, then you recognize that, oh, man, I know exactly where it is. You lead it to him, and he's going to be thankful. Why? Because he didn't have to go look for it. You found it, and you restored it back to him, right? Right? Or you can be a cattle rustler, and you can take it home to yourself. Don't, don't do that, right? So, and then the other idea is, okay, you found something. You know it belongs to somebody else because you know it doesn't belong to you. You take it home. You take care of it. You restore it. You, you hold on to it because there's going to be the owner come to find it, and you restore it to them, right? And that, that's very simple. And he uses these different illustrations, whether it's an ox or whether it's a sheep or whether it's his donkey or even clothing, right? 
all kinds of different things. Now, I want to dive in here and make some really super practical application here in verses 1 to 3. So if you are taking notes, I encourage you to, to, uh, to always take notes, whether you use the ones provided or not. If you are on the online type of thing, grab that bulletin. There's a QR code. Scan it. It'll take you right to those so you can have them online, whatever. But here's your blank. People lose their way. People lose their way, so help them find it. And what you're going to find is this ox and the sheep and the donkey are all pictures of people in, in Scripture. And we're going we're gonna to get into this thing in a very practical way because I know we've already got the gist of it. You find something that belongs to somebody else, give it back, right? That's, that's the gist of verses 1 to 3. But then he says at the end of verse, at the end of verse three, he says, uh, thou mayest not hide thyself. In other words, and here's the other aspect of it. You can maybe find something that belongs to somebody else and you can just leave it and recognize that this belongs to somebody else and you can just pretend you never saw it and go about your merry way. Well, we're gonna get into that. And so people lose their way, but it's our responsibility to help them find it. In other words, don't get lost when you find something that, or someone that is lost. Right? Don't you get lost. Don't you avoid. Don't you hide from it. Um, and so just simple, simple point here is we have the responsibility to help believers who are close, that we're close to, and to help believers we aren't close to. Notice this. He says, thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. In other words, you know this person. You know this brother. You know this brother or sister in Christ and there is something off, they're, they're missing something and you have found it. You've identified what the issue is. You can either avoid them, you can hide yourself or you can interject yourself into that situation and bring what was lost back to them, right? And you do that because you know them, you know where they live, you know what belongs to them. But then you get to verse two and if thy brother be not nigh unto thee or thou know him not, you're gonna have believers, you're gonna have people from other churches. There might be somebody in this church that you don't know. And you come across something, you realize, wow, this person, is, somebody has lost something. It's your responsibility to help them find it, right? And that's what I want to get into. And so let's look at four different scenarios. We're going to look at the ox. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to look at the sheep. We're going to look at the ass, the donkey. And we're also going to look at the raiment, the four different scenarios here. So scenario one, scenario number one, is a believer is separated from someone that they labor beside. Uh, you're gonna, there's going to be times where you are interacting with the body of Christ and you recognize that these two people used to work side by side in, in tandem. They were plowing the field together and they were laboring beside one another. And the ox for us is a picture of another believer. That's what the ox is a picture of. An ox is a picture of another believer. So it says, thou shalt not see thy brother's ox Okay, well, that ox it always in scripture is a picture of another believer. In other words, a co-laborer in Christ, a co-laborer that you are plowing together with. Everybody with me? So look at this, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 18. For scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth the corn, and the laborer, laborer and ox, they're the, it's referring to the same thing. So the laborer is worthy of his reward. So an ox is a laborer. So I don't want you, when you hear farming or whatever in the old days, and it still happens all over the world, they use oxen to, to, to plow the fields or the harvest or whatever. They would always have a yoke of oxen, one here and one over here, and they would work together. Usually a more mature ox with a less mature ox so that this one would learn how to do this. And eventually they would have two two teams. It's called discipleship, right? It's called discipleship. And so um, the, in, the, in our scenario here, there's an ox that has been no longer where it belongs. It has been separated somehow from another believer. They're, they used to work together. They used to work in tandem, but now there's a separation. You see that, whether there's division or whether there's miscommunication or whatever it may be, there's a separation of oxen. There's a separation of work being done. And I love this illustration you find here in Acts 15. So you have all these, all these blanks right here. Acts chapter 15, verses 37 and 38. So Barnabas and Saul are on getting ready to hit the second missionary trip. 
And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. You see that in Acts 15, verse 37. So Barnabas and Saul, they're getting ready to go off on this missionary trip to check on all these churches that they've started and planted. And Barnabas says, hey, I want to take John Mark with us. Um, You find out that later in 2 Timothy that Barnabas and John Mark are related. But there's a problem. There's a problem, verse 38. But Paul thought not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. In other words, in Acts 13, Paul and and Barnabas have gone off on their way and, and they've went on this missionary journey. They had John Mark to their minister. And when things got a little bit tough, John Mark left. He quit the work. In other words, the ox left. No more yoke together with them. And he runs all the way back to Jerusalem. And what you don't know until you do some Bible study is you find out that there's in Jerusalem, there's a guy named Peter. You ever heard of that guy? So Peter grabs a hold of John Mark and disciples him and pours into him and, 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 and works in tandem with him, takes him over into Babylon and does all kinds of different things. And this guy, John Mark, ends up becoming the guy who writes the gospel of Mark. The guy who quit ends up writing the gospel of Mark. Well, I think that's phenomenal because at the end of Paul's ministry, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, only Luke, he says, only Luke was with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So now there's a restoration, isn't there? Somebody has interjected into John Mark and says, okay, you've been separated from Saul for so long. You need to grow up. You need to mature. You need to be discipled. You need to be poured into. And so much so that now Paul understands that something has happened in John Mark's life, that there's been maturity. There's been growth. And and Paul says, hey, there was division at one time. Now let's be restored. What happened? Peter and a few others said, man, I recognize that an ox has been lost. Help me restore it back. And at the end of his ministry, at the end of Paul's life, there's a restoration between two believers who used to be co-laborers where they separated and now they're back together. Everybody see that? So it's our job when we see somebody or we see people who used to plow together or work together and there's a little division, there's some separation. It's our job because we love them to restore that which is lost and bring it back together. Amen, church? Right? That's scenario number one. Now, scenario number two, you see this in verse one. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray. So scenario number two is a believer separated from someone they are shepherding. They are leading. They are investing in. They're responsible for shepherding these sheep. Right? So a sheep is a member of the flock. We're all sheep. Amen? If you're a believer in Christ, you know Christ is your savior. You are a sheep. You are one of the flock. Now, what happens when when there's a separation between the shepherd and the flock? What happens when there's a a separation between a a pastor and one of the sheep? Between a discipler and and a disciple? Between a teacher and a student? Between, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways that there could be separation. Jeremiah 23, verse 2. Jeremiah 23, verse 2 says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people. Right? So the job of these pastors is to feed the people. He says, ye have scattered my flock. So flock and people synonymous, right? You've scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. In other words, brought them back, brought them back into fellowship. He says, behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. Don't be wicked and lose something and then just let it be lost. Right? And you even find that here in the text. Sometimes sometimes you don't even know that somebody's lost. You don't even know that a cow's been missing. You don't even know that an ox has gone. You don't even know that a sheep has gotten got out. But sometimes you maybe have driven it away. And what you find in verse 2 of the text is this brother who's afar off or this, this distant one has come searching for that which was lost, right? And if you know it, you see it and say, hey, I want to restore that back in fellowship with you. And it's going to take some conversation. It's going to take some, it's going to take some effort. In other words, you're going to have to have your head on a swivel and pay attention who's, 
Who has lost this thing that I'm taking care of? I'm, I'm, I'm making sure that this sheep is fed. I'm making sure that this thing is taken care of because just maybe it belongs in another fold and not necessarily mine. Right? I have to understand that as well. So there's maybe times where a pastor or a, or a leader or a disciple has caught where there's been division, whether it's communication or whatever there is, but the idea is that they be restored. Matthew chapter 18, here's the next passage. Matthew chapter 18, verses 11 and 12. He says, for the son of man has come to save that which was lost. How think ye if a man have an hundred sheep and have one of them go astray? Doth he not leave the 90 and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which has gone astray? It's our responsibility when we see something is lost to chase after it, to go after it and try to bring it back into the fold, bring it back to where it belongs. And it's our job as the body of Christ, it's our job as a brother or as a sister to recognize, oh wait, there's maybe a separation, there may be a problem, it's our job to help people find their way when they have lost it. Amen, church? Amen, church? Everybody with me? So let's move to scenario number three. Because you see this down in verse three. He says, in like manner shalt thou do with his ass, and so shalt thou do with his raiment. So not just the ox and not just, not just the sheep, but scenario number three, a believer is separated from, so scenario number three is when a believer is separated from someone who is unsaved or lost because an ass or a donkey in scripture is always picturing a lost person, somebody who does not know Christ. Always in scripture, it's a picture of somebody who is separated from the Lord, has no relationship with God whatsoever. Check this out. Exodus chapter 13. Exodus 13, verse 12 and 13. He says that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix. In other words, everything that is born, separate to the Lord. And every first thing that cometh of, of a beast, which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord's, verse 13. And every firstling of an ass... Thou shalt redeem with the lamb. Wow. What does that mean? And so so all these all these sheep are giving birth and and they're supposed to be just dedicating the first the firstlings to the Lord. In other words, they're gonna be sacrificed, they're gonna be given over to the Lord, but anytime a donkey is born. So anytime a donkey is born, now you gotta go get a lamb and kill the lamb because you're gonna keep the donkey. Does anybody see a picture here? Because the ass or this donkey is a picture of a lost person. And the only way you can keep this thing is if it's redeemed with the blood of a lamb. That's the only way we can keep it. Now, what happens if it's not redeemed with the blood of the lamb? He says in the last part of verse 13, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. It dies. So if they weren't, if they weren't gonna keep this donkey, if they didn't wanna sacrifice a lamb for it, then there is no lamb's blood spilt. What happens to the ass? What happens to the donkey? It's gone. And every person you know who doesn't know Christ, who hasn't had the lamb's blood applied to their life, they will spend a Christless eternity. They will spend separated from the Lord forever in what's called in the second death, an eternal death separated from God in a place called the lake of fire. It's our job as believers to recognize and to understand that there just may be somebody in Karen Fudge's world that she loves dearly and they don't know Christ. They are unsaved. It's our job as, a, as, as believers, as brothers and sisters in Christ to come alongside and recognize that which is lost and see what we can do to redeem it with the blood of the lamb so it can be restored unto her. That's the message that's being taught here. Job chapter 11, verse 12. For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. What does that mean? When you're anybody that's born, you are separate, born in separation from God. You need the blood of a lamb to be applied. If you know somebody here who has a loved one or people they know or, and they're separated from this, they, they need the lost to become, come to Christ. They need the lost to be redeemed with the blood of the lamb. It's your responsibility and my responsibility to help them find their way. Amen, church? That's scenario number three. 
And then you get to scenario number four and you see this in verse three. He says, in like manner shalt thou do with his ass and so shalt thou do with his raiment and his clothing, right? So here's scenario number four. You've run into a believer, you run into a situation where you find out a believer has been separated from personal holiness, from personal holiness. What is raiment? What is this raiment a picture of? Well, this raiment is a picture of your, of a saint's righteousness, the righteousness of God. That's what it's a picture of. In other words, so you, you find out there's a believer who's lost his raiment. What does that tell you? That means their flesh is on display. Truth? I mean, you come across somebody, I mean, hang out with a three-year-old long enough, they'll be naked in no time. What happens? They lost their raiment. Their flesh is on display and they like it. And what do you have to do? You have to chase after them and get the clothes back on them, cover, the, cover them up, right? Man, you, you'll run into believers who are the exact same way. You'll be walking along and find out, whoa, their flesh is on complete display. They have lost the righteousness of God. They have set it aside. Their raiment is off of them. What is up with that? Look at this, Revelation chapter three, verse 18. Revelation chapter three and verse 18, he says, I counsel thee, to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white, what? Raiment. Why is he telling them to buy white raiment? Because they're naked. In that passage, he tells them that they're blind and they're miserable and they're, they're naked. And so his counsel to them is to buy white raiment, not just any raiment, but white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. And that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Well, what's up with this white raiment? Revelation 19 verse eight gives you the answer. Revelation 19, eight says, and to her, that's the church was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And just maybe as you're going about your life and doing your business and, and, and ministering and making disciples and going to work and doing your hobbies and you come in contact with another brother and you recognize real quick that their flesh is on display, what's your job? Your job is to help them find their way back to their raiment, the righteousness of God. Listen, you're walking in the flesh here, man. And sometimes you need somebody to just come alongside and says, you need to get some clothes on, man. That's pretty gross. Cover that up. You need to get in the spirit of God. You need to be clothed in the righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He became our sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And yet there are times where we as believers can be separated so much from the righteousness of God that we are appearing naked and our flesh is on complete display. It's my job to let you know that. And if you ever find me in that state, please tell me to cover up. Amen. Right? Amen. we have the responsibility to help believers we're close to and believers we're not close to to help them find their way. And unfortunately, sometimes we recognize the situation. We recognize that there's division between oxen. We recognize that there's a separation between disciple and discipler. We recognize that there may be a separation between pastor and, and sheep. There may be a problem there. And instead of saying anything, we just pretend like we never saw it. We pretend that we didn't identify the problem. We go about our merry little lives and there's a problem, which takes us to the next thing. Here's the next point. Will we choose to take our responsibility seriously or not? What choice are you gonna make? Are you going to take this seriously or not? Are you going to restore it or are you going to hide yourself? He says twice in verses one to three, don't hide yourself. Why well, just don't want to get involved? It's too messy. It's too ugly. Yeah, that is true. It, again, counseling is hard. It is messy and it is ugly. Dealing with broken relationships is hard and it is ugly. Leading people to Christ is not always fun. The Bible calls it labor for a reason. It is difficult and it is messy, but it's necessary. 
Because here's the next two questions. The first one is this. Will I choose to restore what was lost by leading it back to where it belongs? Will you choose to restore what was lost by leading it back to where it belongs? In other words, you found it. You recognize the issue. Will you restore it? Will you broach that subject? Will you, will you restore to where it belongs? In other words, what was lost has now been found. Will there be a celebration? Or, here's the other side of it, or... Will I choose to avoid what was found by leaving it where I found it? Will you recognize the problem? Will you recognize that you have the opportunity to help this person get saved, to help restore this raiment back to this person, to, to bring them back into fellowship with another believer, to bring, bring the sheep back into the fold? You have an opportunity to do that and you found it. Will you avoid, your, avoid it altogether and leave it where you found it? Because here's what happens. That which was lost stays lost. The problem never goes away. There's still division. There's still separation. The ass is still not redeemed. And that believer is still walking in their flesh and not covered with the righteousness of God. Are we going to take this seriously or not? That's a heavy topic, isn't it? But it's our responsibility to do that. I, I, I would bet out of all those four scenarios, you've identified with at least one of them. Been guilty of one, or maybe you're the one who's lost something. By the way, if you have lost something, don't sit back and wait for somebody to return it back to you. According to verse two, you should be going to search for it. You have the responsibility to go looking for it too. Don't just sit back and wait for somebody to recognize that there's an issue and come save your day. No, you recognize you've lost something, go after it, go find it. And Lord willing, there's gonna be a believer, there's gonna be another brother or sister that will be willing to say, hey, look what I found. Here's what I recognize. Help, let me help you restore this, whatever that might be. That's what we find in verses one to three. Now let's move to verse four. <clears throat> because in verse four, he says, thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down. We don't want to go back into what an ass is or an ox is. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or ox fall down by the way and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. In other words, this isn't a broken relationship. This isn't somebody's lost something. No, here's your next blank. People will fall. So help them get up. People are going to fall, right? Isn't that true? People are going to stumble. They're going to fall. It's our job as brothers and sisters in Christ to help them get up, to help them get up. I think a lot of times in, in those situations, we force them to stay down. We, we say, well, I'm standing. Why aren't you? Because uh, you won't help me get up. You like it it when I'm down and you like it when you're standing. It's crazy to me that there even has to be a verse in the Bible that says this. I mean, it, it should go without saying. You, you see another brother and sister's ox or, or the ass fall down, your job is to help them get back up. Don't hide yourself. Don't, don't recognize the problem and just go pretend I didn't see that. And just go about my merry way. That's wicked, that's sin. Your job is to help them get back up. Which also implies that if you have fallen, it's time to get up, right? Quit wallowing in it, quit laying there. I've fallen and I can't get up. No, sometimes you won't get up, get up. It's implied, the idea is to get up and get busy, get after it. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Oh, it's easy to point out people who've fallen. It's easy to point out other people's fail failures. But be careful, you thinking you're standing. It's not long until you're flat on your back. Been there, done that. A bunch of times. So back in the day, when I was in high school, and there was an ice storm, one of my favorite things to do was to watch people go from one build, building in high school over to the lunchroom and slip on the ice. I enjoyed that. It was like great entertainment. 
I'm like, man, this guy's an idiot. Watch this. He's going to fall. Wow. Sure enough. Ha, 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 ha. Funny, funny. Until I'm the one falling. Because I know where not to watch. Because I've seen where they slipped and fall. Okay. I won't go that way. And next thing I know, I'm laying on my back. Take heed. I think about that every single time I read that verse. Take heed that you stand, unless you fall. Listen, your job when you see somebody that has fallen, your job is not to remind them that they've fallen. I think they pretty much put that one together. Your job is to help them get up. And I've never had to help a donkey up. I just never have. I can't imagine that's very fun. Right? I just, I can't imagine it's being very, very fun. Because some people refuse to get up. Some people have chosen to fall. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. And brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of what? Meekness. You don't walk by going, get up, get up, get up, get up. You're not going to nag somebody up. It's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to walk by and say, you idiot, get up. I told you, you're going to fall. Get up, get up, get up. And walk by and say, I told you, you're just lazy. Get up. It's not going to work. In the spirit of meekness, what does that mean? You've got to humble yourself. Power and subjection, you reach down. And you help them up. Considering that self, lest they also be tempted. If you're not careful, it'll be you laying down and people walking by making fun of you. Keeping you down, kicking you down. And they won't let you get up. They prefer you down because they want to talk down on you thinking they're bigger and better. No, it doesn't work like that. Our job is to help them get up. Proverbs 24, verse 16. For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. That tells me something. That we all have a propensity to fall. We all have a propensity to, to, to fall flat on our face at times. And a just man says, I don't belong here. It's time to get up. And I'll do it again. If I get knocked down, I'll get right back up again. But he says at the end, and, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. And that's going to take a little bit extra. It's going to take a little bit extra. So what you see in Proverbs 24 is a picture of the ox and a picture of the donkey. One is easier to get up. One is going to take some cleaning up. You fall into something, it's going to take a while just to get back up and get all that filth off of you. It's going to take somebody else to come alongside you and love you enough to pour into you and do it. Now, verse 5. Let me just tell you, there are some crazy people teaching some crazy things out of this verse. Verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination in the Lord thy God. Can I just say, it doesn't say women can't wear pants. Can I just say that? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that in your Bible. Women can't wear pants. It says, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Let's make an application here, verse 5. Next blank. People will be fake. People will pretend. Don't be fooled by their disguise. Don't do it. Don't be fooled by their disguise. You guys been hearing about what's been going on in Afghanistan? Maybe paying attention to the news? Did you know your brothers and sisters in Christ are dying in Afghanistan today? They're dying in Afghanistan today. Now listen, I've been paying attention to different stories, different, different deals. There were some believers answered the door and there were some ladies outside asking for help. And so they brought them in, found out that they weren't ladies. There are men dressed as ladies and those men I'll be careful with what I say, had their way and left them to die. There will be some people in disguise. There will be some people who are fake. Don't fall for their lies and don't fall for their disguise. 
he says a woman is supposed to dress the way a woman is and a man is supposed to dress the way that a man is. I mean, I think the clear teaching here is God made two genders. He made you one of them. That's the clear teaching of the verse. Pretty plain, pretty plain and clear. I don't care what, what the school says and I don't care what psychiatrists say. There's two genders and God made you one of them. That's the clear teaching of the verse. But I think there's a second clear teaching. People shouldn't have to wonder who you are. They shouldn't have to question. It should be evident. And I think all too often, people put on disguises to pretend to be something that they're not. Be careful that we don't fall into that trap. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 and 16. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. I love this next verse. You shall know them by their fruits. How do you find out what's really going on behind the mask? How do you find out what's really going on behind the disguise? Follow the fruit. You'll find out real quick. But I think the overarching teaching that we've got to get here, you're going to claim to be a believer and then act like a lost person? That confuses people, right? You're going to claim to be this, but act like this, or God's made you this way, but you're going to try to pretend to be something else. That doesn't work. God makes it very clear. People should know who you are just by having a conversation, just by looking at you. They should be able to tell. They shouldn't have to look through the mask. They shouldn't have to look through the disguise. I guess I'm just saying, be genuine, but don't fall for anybody's disguise. Check out the fruit. Now, I had no other way way to break this down, all right? I had other places to go and other things to do, but we would have been here until 12, and that would not have been good. So, you get a shorter message today. Everybody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You get a shorter message today. And you get to get to the Mexican restaurant maybe a little sooner. But can I just encourage you to read uh, next week? We're only going to get to verse 12. We're not going to get any further than verse 12. Um, We're going to talk about some things. So next week, probably a little shorter message because the subject matter of the rest of the chapter is pretty heavy. And honestly, as a pastor, I prefer to cover some of that stuff without children in the room. Okay, and so whatever it takes us, we're not starting the rest of the chapter really into the next couple chapters until our children are being ministered to over here just because of the subject matter we got to get into, all right? Y'all can read the passages and know what we're going to talk about, all right? You we'll wait till you, we just won't get into that until our children are gone. But so um, shorter message today, probably shorter message next week. I don't think anybody's going to complain about that. I know Corrine's not. So, guys, what are we doing today at 5 o'clock? What are we doing today at 5 o'clock? Yeah, we're all playing softball or showing up, right? We want you to be there. And I, I understand not everybody can be there. Some people have some things going on, but I really want to encourage you there. Um, that doesn't mean leave Iola or Humboldt or whatever at 5. It starts at 5. We need you there before 5. So be there a little before. Um, um, so let me just clear off a spot real quick. Tammy, why don't you come up here for a moment? She was staring at me like, here we go. Come on up real quick. This is not Tammy's last Sunday. At least it better not be. So Tammy and and Russ, God's put something on their heart. Russ, you're more than welcome to come on up too if you'd like. But he says, I'm good. I'm good. Tammy, God's been putting some things on her heart um, about a way to minister within our body, provide a kind of a, a different kind of a ministry. And I've made mention of it a few weeks ago. We call it Harvesting Healthy Opportunities, right? H2O. And there's a Facebook page and everything. If you're on Facebook, you probably got an invite to it. If not, search it, H2O, Harvesting Healthy Opportunities, you'll find it. And the premise, the idea behind this ministry is to help our body become more healthy in our spiritual walk with the Jesus uh, emotionally, right? Spiritually, what's, what's going on inside of us. And then with our bodies, right? 
And, and so you'll notice that Tammy posts almost every day something of an opportunity of something to think about, something to meditate on, or, hey, there's some people working out over here, or, hey, I'm going to get together and do some, I'm going to go ride my bike. Anybody wants to join me. The idea is not always to provide something for you to do healthy, but to remind you of opportunities that already exist within the body of Christ or within our community. And one of those would be softball today, right? And so I'm sure there'll be a post later. If not, there needs to be one. I'm Make one. Um, needs to be a post of, hey, there's an opportunity for us to be healthy with our bodies. Let's get active. But also, not only is it healthy opportunities, um, but spiritual, because we're going to have some great conversations, encouraging one another. Um, maybe there might be some counseling that happens underneath the tree. I don't know. But there's potential for all three of those areas to be hit at a simple little event where we're going to play softball and eat um, hot dogs filled with nitrates. I don't know how God's able to do it, but he's going to do something <laughs> with all that. So I brought her up here. I'm going to give you till 1137 to share your heart. Oh, Can you do that? Minutes. Yep, two minutes. <laughs> you just talk loudly. I'm good. I'm going to come in close. Um, you said everything. Okay, but say it again. Okay, okay. <laughs> what I wanted to do um, is... Just provide a way, everyone struggles with the same things. And we all think that we're in the same boat and are in, in our own little boat. And we're not, we're all, we're all struggling with making healthy choices. We're all struggling with our faith, with our emotions, socially. This is a hard time. And I just wanted to provide an opportunity. Um, hey, I'm gonna go for a walk. Anyone wanna join me? Hey. There's a group that goes over and goes to the pool. I hate that, but they do it anyway. <laughs> but there's great opportunities, and we should always be helping and lifting each other up. Amen. We're, we're all in this boat together, and it's not easy. But we can do it together a lot easier than you can on your own. Amen. Okay, Amen. I'm good. Can I go now? Yeah, you can oh. go now. You did that in a minute and a half. Good job. It sounds a lot like, it sounds a lot to me like oxen plowing together. That's what it sounds like to me. That we come alongside and we need each other. It's important to build our relationships, to be healthy and all those different things. And I need people to, to say, hey, Tony, you've lost, some, uh, you lost your way here. Can I, can I help you find, can I help you find your way? It doesn't mean you always have to be the one to fix everybody either, Right? Recognize you need to be fixed too, right? We all have room to grow. So let's stand together. We're going to be dismissed. Make sure you find a couple of people you've yet to say hi to. Um, in fact, do this. Find three or four people, give them a high five, and uh, maybe tell them what your favorite color is so they get to know you, whatever it is. But guys, um, don't hear a message like this and then think about somebody across the room that needs to get something figured out or, man, they have that issue or that issue. Listen, now's the time to figure out, have you lost something? If you've lost something, you better start finding it. Trusting that God's got another brother or sister in Christ that just might have what you've been looking for and you need it. So Dave, will you close in prayer? We'll be dismissed. See you guys at five o'clock.